Peace and Black Power family. This is the Prince of Pan-Africanism. A.K.A. King Kong Consciousness. A.K.A. the most requested black scholar in the world. A.K.A. leading Pan-Africanist at the present moment. A.K.A. one of the greatest orators of all time. A.K.A. the greatest black certified school psychologist in American history. A.K.A. founder and principal of the Frederick Douglass Marcus Garvey RBG International Leadership Academy for Pan-African Excellence. Brothers and sisters, I'm not going to keep you too long. But in this tutorial, I want to address something. Yesterday, I posted on my Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook that the NBA, Negro Basketball Association, has decided that it's going to paint Black Lives Matter on the basketball court when the NBA resumes its season later this month. They plan to have Black Lives Matter on the basketball court when the NBA resumes play later this month. They have also announced that they will allow NBA players to put social justice phrases on their basketball jerseys. Whether this will replace their last name, whether this will go under their number, which is under their last name, I don't know. But they are, they're going to allow the NBA players to put social justice statements on their jersey. And they're going to paint Black Lives Matter on the court. Some of you who are of low political intelligence in development because you spend most of your life on YouTube, social network. I don't know when the last time you read a nonfiction book, something other than Source, Sports Illustrated, Double XL, Essence, or Ebony. But anyway, some of you felt that that was a satisfactory gesture. And even those of you who felt that it was not a satisfactory gesture, you commented that you thought it was a good start. Some of you politically uneducated brothers and sisters said, well, Dr. Umar, we have to start somewhere. Now, that's interesting. That's interesting. We've been under British North American rule in this country for 400 years as of last August. So this August, next month, will be 401 years. And after 401 years, 155 of which have been post-emancipation. And you're telling me that 401 years later, or 155 years post-emancipation, that you are comfortable with a multinational corporation known as the NBA, who has made billions of dollars off of raw black African talent, have made billions of dollars off of raw black African talent. And you're telling me that because they're going to paint Black Lives Matter on the court and because they're going to allow Negro athletes to put social justice phrases on the back of their jersey, you're telling me that that represents some kind of change for black America. Let me explain something to you. Let me explain something to you. 
The reason why that is not a start in the right direction. The reason why that is not the beginning of a social transformation. The reason why black America cannot once again, once again, allow itself to be bamboozled and hoodwinked by this latest NBA gesture is because Anyone who has studied political history, anyone with a little bit of common sense, anyone who has ever went shopping for anything in your life, and all of us have been shopping, loaf of bread, clothing, gas, toiletries, we have all been shopping. When you walk into a store to buy something, and there's no price tag on the merchandise. You ask the merchant, how much does this pair of sneakers cost? At that moment, the merchant can decide to be honest or the merchant can decide to hustle you. Now, you're looking at a pair of flip flops that only cost five dollars, but the merchant wants to see how much of a sucker you are. The merchant wants to see how much of a sucker you are. So instead of telling you that the flip-flops only cost $5, the merchant tells you that the flip-flops cost $50. Now at that moment that the merchant has offered you an exchange rate for those flip-flops. At the moment that the sales pitch was made, you have a decision to make. You have a split second decision to make. Are you gonna allow yourself to get hustled for the $50? Or are you gonna try to talk the merchant into a better deal because he's getting over? The flip-flops don't cost $50. They're only worth $5. But the merchant needs to test your savvy. The merchant needs to test your intelligence. The merchant is trying to see if he can get over on your silly, goofy, coon ass. So if you say, I'll pay $50 for the flip-flops, the merchant says to himself, what a sucker I got. They didn't bother to check the price. They, did, they could have Googled the brand and saw what they were really worth. They didn't try to talk me down. They simply took the price that I gave them. And guess what? After you accept the $50 price tag, after you accept the $50 price tag, you cannot come back later. You cannot come back later and say to the merchant, you overcharged me. I found out that these flip-flops are only worth $5. You owe me $45. And the merchant says, I don't go owe you anything. And you say, well, why not? You overcharged me by $45 for these flip-flops. And guess what the merchant is going to say? The merchant is going to say, no one forced you to buy. I did not put a gun to your head. It was totally up to your discretion as to whether or not you wanted to overpay for the flip flops. The fact that you are a fool is not my responsibility. And guess what? The merchant is right. The merchant is not responsible for your ignorance. Although you might not have known how much the flip-flops really cost, you had an obligation to yourself to investigate a little further before you close the deal. Because anyone who has ever been taken advantage of at a store knows that once the deal is sealed, you cannot go back and renegotiate. Once you drive off in that car, you cannot go back and negotiate. Once you sign the papers for that house, you cannot go back and negotiate. After you pay 
for that haircut or that hairdo. You cannot go back and negotiate. So how does this relate to the Negro Basketball Association? It relates because the NBA is testing black America and the NBA is testing its black athletes. The NBA is trying to see if they can pay the lowest price possible to satisfy the Negro appetite for justice. Let me say it again. The NBA is trying to see if they can pay the lowest price possible to appease the Negro appetite for justice. And guess what? If we accept the offering price that the NBA is giving us, if we accept their offer, their offer for social justice, the NBA is offering in exchange for continued support from its players in black America. The NBA is offering you some Black Lives Matter tattoos on the basketball court. And they are offering you some social justice slogans on the back of the jerseys. And if you accept that, there is no going back to the negotiating table later. It is an insult. It is an absolute insult for a corporation that has made billions, hundreds of billions of dollars off of black folk. To offer you in exchange for its historical failure to do anything to bring about political, economic, or social justice for black folks, their offer is words, not money, not resources, not concessions. They're going to give you words, a multi-billion dollar multinational corporation is going to give black people words in exchange for your suffering. Black Lives Matter on the court and social justice slogans on the back of jerseys. And the irony of the jersey is what? The irony of the jersey lies in the fact that NBA players, most of them, don't receive any revenue. Most professional athletes don't receive any revenue whatsoever from their jerseys. So let me tell you how this hustle is going to play out. Let's say Chris Paul, who I love and respect, let's say he puts Black Lives Matter on the back of his Oklahoma City jersey. Let's say LeBron James puts Black Power on the back of his Lakers jersey. Hypothetically speaking, let's say Russell Westbrook puts no justice, no peace on the back of his jersey. Now, keep in mind, they don't receive any revenue. They don't receive any revenue from their jersey sales, none whatsoever. But they're going to put these slogans on the back. And the NBA is going to sell these jerseys with the social justice slogans on the back. Guess what's going to happen a week after the NBA season starts? Guess what is going to happen a week after the NBA season starts? The NBA is going to start selling these jerseys with the social justice slogans on the back. They're going to be collector's items because once this season is over, they're not going to allow it to go anyway because this is just a publicity stunt to improve America's international reputation anyway. And these jerseys are going to be sold for $200, $300 a pop, $600 a pop. Mitchell and Ness special collector's item, $500 a pop. And the players aren't get, going to get a penny from their social justice jerseys. And black America isn't going to get one red cent from these social justice jerseys. They are hustling you 
We are being hustled and conned. This is about money. It is not about social justice. The NBA is very much aware that black America is a little uneasy by them resuming this season amidst the racial turmoil in this country. They know this. There's players who are protesting and sitting out of the NBA season to protest racial justice. The NBA has already lost millions of dollars, maybe even billions, in missed games. They cannot afford for black people not to watch the NBA when it resumes. They have already lost money on missed games due to COVID. They have lost out on TV contracts due to COVID. They have lost out on concession sales, ticket sales, merchandise sales due to COVID. They need to recoup. They need black people to tune in so the networks get the viewers, so they can sell the commercials, so the NBA can jumpstart its corporate economy again. If black folks don't watch them games, the NBA is in trouble. But in addition to getting you to watch the games by giving you words, in addition to getting you to watch the games by giving you words, they're going to sell you those jerseys that your favorite NBA superstar is going to wear with their favorite social justice slogan on the back. They're going to jumpstart merchandise sales by exploiting the 2020 black protest for justice. They're going to jumpstart the return of the NBA's league by exploiting your desire for justice. And they're going to turn that around into a corporate payday. Listen to me well, brothers and sisters. Listen to me well. Listen to me well. The reason why some of you have an issue with my doctrine, the reason why some of you have a very big problem with revolutionary pan-African nationalist is because we don't allow you to scapegoat a white hustle into evidence of black progress. I will not allow you to scapegoat a white corporate hustle into an excuse and a justification for you to do nothing because you don't want to do nothing. And so you can then use it as an excuse not to do anything because you interpreted this empty symbolic gesture from the NBA as proof that America is getting better. I'm not going to let you do that. You hate me for that. You hate me for telling you that the public schools of America should not be teaching your child black history. You hate me for saying that. You hate me for saying that the black community should be teaching its own children their history. You hate me to make you responsible for bringing about your own liberation. You want me to say it's OK for public school to teach black history. Why not? They teach white history. They teach gay history. Why can't they teach black history? The reason they can't teach black history is because they are the thieves of black history. The reason they can't teach black history is because they are jealous of black history. The reason why they cannot teach black history is because there is a conflict of interest for them to teach black history. If you accurately teach black Black history, you undermine and expose white supremacy as a lie. If you accurately teach black history, you undermine and expose white supremacy as a lie. But more than that, but more than that, we have 
Hotep scholars all over YouTube. Formally trained. Self-trained Hotepians all over YouTube. You got formally trained scholars in every university in America, black and white. Some who claim they love black history and love black people. Why can't these Hotepians and other black scholars, why can't they volunteer to teach black history for free inside of the black churches and community centers in our neighborhood after school or during the weekend? After all, churches are only open two or three days a week. One day for Bible study, one day for church, one day for choir, and maybe a fourth day for chicken wing sales. So you got one day for church, one day for choir, one day for Bible study, and one day for chicken wing and Kool-Aid sales. So there's three other days that the church is closed. Why can't the church that takes so much of black people's money and gives them nothing in return for it except hope in a heaven after they die, why can't the church open up on the days they have nothing else going on and the whole Tepians come in and teach black history? Why are we forcing white women to teach black kids who they are? Someone sent me a petition the other day and they asked the Prince of Pan-Africanism to sign this petition to get black history taught in the schools. I refuse to sign the petition. I am not going to work against the petition. I am not going to oppose the petition. I am not going to hate on the petition. But I'm not going to sign it because as a pan-Africanist who believes in self-determination, I believe it is a mistake to get the oppressors of black people to teach our children who they are. That is our responsibility. That is our responsibility. You have all these African-centered PhDs. All these Africana PhDs, all these Hotepians on YouTube, and you mean to tell me what all these people who claim to know who they are, all these woke Negroes, but we want to get white women to teach black children who they are. You can miss me with that nonsense. You can miss me. With that nonsense, I agree. I agree. There are some things that we must fight the system to do. There are some things we must fight the system to do. There's only one criminal justice system in America. So we have to fight for improvements in the criminal justice system. There's only one political system in America. So we have to fight for justice and improvements in the political system. But guess what? The U.S. government gives you the prerogative to create your own educational system. The United States government gives you the prerogative to create your own educational system. So why does a two trillion dollar people? Why does a two trillion dollar people need white women to teach their children who they are? Stop trying to get white people to do everything for you because you are making the argument that slavery was better than freedom. If you are going to become free, 
to go right back to the person who you fought to obtain your freedom and then beg them to do everything for you. What was the purpose of fighting for your emancipation in the first place? If you are going to tell someone that they don't have a right to control your life in the minute they give you a right to control your life and you want you run right back to the person who used to control your life and ask them to retake control of your life, then you are begging to be placed back into slavery. That is absolutely insane. That is absolutely insane. It's like family court. It's like family court. The courts used to sell off black people. The courts used to legislate the punishments for black people. The whippings, the beatings, the castrations, the iron brandings, all of the punishments we received as Africans under slavery was enforced through the courts. The courts upheld and approved and sanctioned those punishments. And the minute you get free from the courts, you want to run back with your baby daddy. You want to run back with your baby mom and you want to beg the white judge. You want to beg the white judge to decide how much time your baby daddy can see his child or how much time, how much money the baby mom going to get from the daddy. What in the hell are we running back to white folks for after we fought so hard to get out from under them? Stop making a case for the re-enslavement of black folks because we don't want to do anything for ourselves and we want to give all burdens to the former slave master. You want him to teach your kids? You want him to create your jobs. You want him to run your family. Why do you want the white man to run your family? This doesn't make any sense to me. This doesn't make any sense to me. Brothers and sisters, we are a two trillion dollar people. We are a two trillion trillion dollar people your problem ain't money reparations people and i support reparations marcus garvey is the father of modern reparations i support it but stop acting like we can't do anything for ourselves until we get some money from the government there you go again i need the slave master to give me an economic stimulus package for my liberation. I need the slave master to give me an economic stimulus package for my liberation. Now, I don't want to talk about the $2 million on Air Jordans. I don't want to talk about that. I don't want to talk about that. I should be able to spend my money on whatever I want to. I don't want to talk about the $20 billion on weaves, perms, and skin lightener. I don't want to talk about that. I have a right. I have a right for perms, weaves, and skin bleach. I have a right. That's my money. I work for that. I don't want to talk about the fact that black people bought twice the amount of Mercedes Benzes as white people did last year, but we don't even have one third of white America's wealth. I don't want to talk about that. My ancestors fought for me to be able to buy a Mercedes Benz. My ancestors died so I can buy a Mercedes. My ancestors died for me to drive a BMW. They died for my Cadillac truck. Who are you, Dr. Umar, to tell me I can't use my hard-earned money to buy a Cadillac truck? My ancestors died for me to have a right to choose what I want to drive. So don't bring up my hair. Don't bring up my Cadillac and my Benz. Don't bring up my two billion, 
$2 million on Air Jordans. Don't bring up my million dollars on McDonald's. That's my money. I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about what the government owes my ancestors. I don't want to talk about my money. I want to talk about what the government owes my ancestors for unpaid labor. So let me understand this, my Negro friends. You're telling Dr. Umar. You're telling Dr. Jermaine Shoemake. You're telling me that you don't want to use your money to finance liberation. But you want to use your ancestors' money to finance your liberation. Let me ask this again because I'm seeing there's a contradiction in the room. There's a contradiction in the room. There is a contradiction in the room. You don't want to use your money to finance your liberation. You want to use your ancestors' money to finance your liberation. How in the hell, how in the hell is it possible that you don't want to dig in your pockets and spend your money to finance your liberation, but you want to dig in your ancestors' pockets and spend their money to finance your liberation. So let me get this right. Let, let, let me understand this. Let me, let me understand this. Dead black people can finance your liberation, but living black people have no responsibility to it. Dead black people can finance your liberation, but living black people have no responsibility to it. Dead black people can finance your liberation, but the living Negro has no obligation whatsoever to discipline his economic habits so that he can use his finances to achieve his own independence and liberation. You Negroes are sick. You Negroes are sick. You Negroes are sick. I'm going to tell you like I told you before. I'm going to tell you like I told you before. The reparations fight can be argued by us, but the outcomes cannot be determined or received by us. I'm going to say it again. The reparation struggle can be argued. We can fight for it. We can fight for it. But I want a clause in there that says under no conditions whatsoever. I know y'all going to hate me for this. I know y'all going to hate me for this. But I want a clause that says under no conditions whatsoever are Negroes born between 2000 and 2050 allowed to touch that money. I'm going to say it again. If it is up to me, any Negro born prior to 2050 cannot touch that money. It goes into an African escrow account and it will sit there until 2050. So that gives us 30 years. That's a whole generation of black kids we can raise. That's a whole generation of FDMG graduates. That's a whole generation of Anna Douglas, Amy Garvey, Princess Academy graduates. We got 30 years to psychologically, psychologically reconstruct the Negro psyche. We have 30 years to psychologically reconstruct the Negro psyche, so by the time our children or grandchildren are around 30 years old, they can access the reparations. But you coons, you coons, and there are exceptions, not all of us are coons, but most of us are, you coons, if it's up to me, will not touch that reparation settlement. You will not touch it. Oh, hell no, you will not touch it. No. We are not politically mature enough. We are not culturally responsible enough. We are not economically serious enough to touch that money. Do you know black folks will waste that entire reparation settlement? And when 2050 rolls around, there will be nothing left. 
for our children and grandchildren. Reparations is not for your generation. Reparations is for the African race. Reparations is for the entire American African colony from now until the end of time. Some of you think that you're supposed to cash in on every penny that was paid to you. And who told you that? Who told you that you're supposed to get every single penny of the unpaid labor due to your ancestors? You Negroes are crazy. I want to get back to the NBA. I want to get back to the NBA. Let me speak about Black Lives Matter, not the organization, but the slogan, Black Lives Matter. Since that slogan was created in the aftermath of the execution of either Trayvon Martin, rest in peace, or Michael Brown, rest in peace, I believe it was Michael Brown in Ferguson, brothers and sisters on the ground who gave birth to Black Lives Matter hashtag. That's what I was told in St. Louis. Shout out to St. Louis, Missouri. The very first donation to the FDMG Academy came from St. Louis. The very first donation to the FDMG Academy came from St. Louis. When that slogan took off during the rebellions under the Barack Obama administration, Black Lives Matter pumped fear into white America's heart. The Black Lives Matter slogan pumped fear into the politician's heart. The Black Lives Matter slogan was a cause for alarm from white police. I would argue that from 2004 until now, okay, when was Trayvon murdered? When was Michael Brown murdered? Michael Brown, what year was that? Let me check. Let me check. Michael Brown, rest in peace to Mike. Shout out to his parents. I'm checking Michael Brown's murder. It was in August. It was Leo season. I do know it was Leo season. August the 9th of 2014. August the 9th of 2014. This August the 9th will be six years since the murder of Michael Brown. This August the 9th will be six years since the murder of Michael Brown. For six years, the Black Lives Matter slogan, even though it was co-opted by an LBGT organization, even though it was co-opted by an LBGTQ organization, the slogan remained powerful. It remained powerful. Let me tell you one of the reasons why they're painting Black Lives Matter on the streets in D.C. Let me tell you one of the reasons why white corporations are plastering Black Lives Matter on all of their merchandise. Let me tell you why politicians, white politicians are wearing Black Lives Matter shirts and why the white protesters had Black Lives Matter posters. Let me tell you why the NBA is going to put Black Lives Matter on the basketball court. You know why? Because one of the greatest strategies of white supremacy, one of the most brilliant military tactics you can ever use to destroy your enemy is to infiltrate, exaggerate, exterminate. Listen to me. I'm speaking about propaganda. I'm speaking about propaganda. I'm speaking about propaganda. When there is a strong movement with a strong slogan, with a strong 
concept. And you want to kill that concept because that concept is powerful and it captures the heart and soul of the movement. You got to do three things to that concept. You have to infiltrate it, which means you have to integrate it. To infiltrate is to integrate. To infiltrate is to integrate. To infiltrate is to integrate. So you first have to infiltrate the Black Lives Matter movement, not the organization, but the grassroots movement. You infiltrate it. Then you exaggerate it. What do I mean by that? You make it look like you care more about the movement than the people who are running it. You give the impression that you care more about black lives than black people. You exaggerate. And then you take on the slogan and you use it and you spread it all over the place. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter. Black lives matter on the street. Black lives matter on the white t-shirt. Black lives matter on the NBA court. You infiltrate it. You exaggerate it. And by exaggerating it, you exterminate the power of the movement. Listen to me. I've never been wrong on a political prediction yet. Listen to me. I've never been wrong on a political prediction yet. In five years, if it takes that long, it might only take three years. It might only take two years. But I can promise you, in five years, the Black Lives Matter slogan, hashtag, will have been so co-opted, so integrated, so exaggerated that it will have no more power. You're going to have to come up with another slogan because they have killed the fire and the power behind it because you allowed people outside the community to take it, to market it, to propagate it, to trivialize it, and to render it useless. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again, brothers and sisters. I'm going to say it again. Any slogan that is important to you, any symbol of struggle that is important to you, we're talking about symbols and slogans. We're talking about symbols and slogans. We're talking about symbols and slogans. If it means something to you, no one else should have access to it because it is sacred. Something that is sacred is not allowed to be expropriated by any other group for any other reason, even if they claim to stand in solidarity with you. The NBA is helping to destroy the black power behind the Black Lives Matter slogan. The U.S. government is helping to destroy the black power behind the Black Lives Matter slogan. You think you're helping the movement by letting all these non-Africans run away with your slogan and your symbol. You are wrong. You are wrong. Let me give you an example. Can we go back to Malcolm X? Can we go back to Spike Lee's Malcolm X movie? Who remembers that? When Spike Lee released the Malcolm X movie, when Spike Lee released the Malcolm X movie, there was a whole big resurgence of Malcolm X energy. To go along with that resurgence of Malcolm X energy, they started selling Malcolm X hats. They started selling Malcolm X t-shirts, Malcolm X posters, Malcolm X flags, Malcolm X this, Malcolm X that. Y'all remember that? Y'all remember that? And for a while, the Malcolm X movement of the early 90s that began after Spike Lee's movie was released was powerful. It represented a resurgence of black pride and black power, but then somebody crossed over. 
somebody crossed over and they started allowing white companies to sell the Malcolm X at and they started letting China import fake dashiki Malcolm X t-shirts. Do y'all remember this? How many of y'all remember this? And before you know it, Malcolm X was being sold in a Chinese store and Malcolm X was being sold in a poppy shop and Malcolm X was all on Canal Street in New York. And what they did was they infiltrated it. They exaggerated it and then they exterminated the Malcolm X move movement lost its power because we allowed it to be co-opted for white corporate benefit. What they did to the Malcolm X move movement of the 1990s is exactly what they're doing to the Black Lives Matter movement right now. We're talking slogans and symbols, slogans and symbols. I'm going to give you another example. The Ethiopian flag. First, let me give shout out to my Rastafari brothers and sisters. Shout out to my Ethiopian World Federation, Rastafari. Shout out to my Naya Bingi, Rastafari. Shout out to my 12 tribes, Rastafari. And of course, and of course, and of course, shout out to my Bobo Shanti, Ethiopian, African, Black, International Congress wing of the Rastafari movement. The most Marcus Garvey and revolutionary Pan-African nationalists of them all. Respecting my Rasta family. Respecting my Rastafari family from around the world. And we give special shout out to Rastafari. Because had it not been for Rastafari, the life and legacy, the life and legacy of the works of the most honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey may have been lost to history. Because all of the leaders and organizations and opportunists who came after Marcus Garvey, who copied and stole and borrowed and plagiarized his work, refused to admit that Garvey was their teacher. So had it not been for Rastafari, we would not know that it was Garvey. It was Garvey. Rastafari kept the Garvey memory alive. Had it not been for them, these copycat organizations would have all but killed the legacy of Marcus Garvey. But the Ethiopian flag, the Ethiopian flag, the flag of the only African nation to have never been colonized was, and for some of us still is, a strong symbol for African independence, a strong symbol for African emancipation, a strong symbol for Pan-Africanism, a strong symbol for independence. But guess what? In the 1990s, some of our Jamaican culture shops, I'm not going to put this on Rastafari, although some Rastafari may be guilty. I'm not going to put this on Rastafari, but some Rastafari may be guilty. They started allowing white folk to buy and wear the Ethiopian flag. Somebody infiltrated the Ethiopian pride movement with a multicultural agenda that allowed non-Africans to start wearing and waving the Ethiopian flag. And they continue to do it to this very day. As a result of that, brothers and sisters, the Ethiopian flag does not carry the same weight when it comes to African strength and power that it once did because we allowed non-Africans to expropriate a sacred African symbol. Can I give you another one? I want to give you one more symbol. I'm showing you how we must protect our sacred signs and symbols, brothers and sisters. Your signs, symbols, and slogans are sacred. Stop letting them get 
exploited by corporations to number one, make money off you, and number two, kill the black power behind the symbol and the, and the slogan and the sign. Stop it. I'll give you another one. Kente cloth. Shout out to my brothers and sisters of the Akan Nation of Ghana. Shout out to my brothers and sisters of the Akan Nation of Ghana. Unfortunately, Dr. Umar will not be having a group tour to Africa this year due to COVID restrictions. This will be the first year I will not have a group trip to the mother continent due to COVID restrictions. But I thank Ghana for initiating the year of return all over the mother continent. Rest in peace to Osajifo, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and all of the great Pan-Africanists across the mother continent. We enjoyed ourselves last summer in Ghana during the year of return. My greatest trip home to Ghana yet. Nigeria, we coming. Sierra Leone, hold on, we coming. Liberia, I will be returning. Congo, we coming. Lesotho, we coming. Kenya, we coming. Malawi, we coming. Rwanda, we coming. Yes. Zimbabwe, we coming. And all the nations, we coming. But they took Malcolm X, exaggerated it, exterminated it, killed the power. They took the Ethiopian flag, exaggerated it, exterminated, killed a lot of the power. Still has some, but they killed a lot of it. And now let's talk about kente cloth. Kente cloth is a sacred fabric of the Akan people of Ghana. Kente cloth is spiritual. Kente cloth is cultural. Kente cloth is sacred to African people. And it is sacred to our Akan family in Ghana. But guess what? Guess what happened? Somebody infiltrated the African transcultural movement to bring African symbols to America. So we started bringing the kente cloth, but we didn't have a Garvey mindset. We started bringing the Akan symbols, but we didn't have a Garvey mindset. So black America started bringing these symbols to America. And Africa is also at fault for this, too. Because as white folks started traveling to the mother continent, instead of us telling them, unfortunately, you can buy a little piece. We'll give you a little piece of kente cloth. You can buy a little piece of kente cloth for your library to hang up in your house. We'll give you that. But you cannot wear this. This is sacred to African people. You cannot wear this fabric. This fabric goes back to the founding of our people. This is an African thing. You cannot wear this. We will give you a little two. You can buy a foot of it, but you cannot wear this. You cannot wear this. When we brought the kente cloth to America, we should have said you cannot wear this. But instead, being the multiculturalist that church and mosque have made us, being the multiculturalist that Christianity and Islam have made us, when people started saying, oh, that looks so beautiful. I love that kente cloth. How can I get some? Thirsty Negroes. This is why you got to have principled economics. This is why you have to have principled economics. This is why you have to have principled economics. Thirsty Negroes started selling, importing and selling kente cloth to non-African people. So McDonald's. And Burger King and Wendy's and Pizza Hut and every white corporation in America said, if it's okay for non-Africans to wear the kente cloth, hell, we're going to start wearing the kente cloth during Black History Month and during Kwanzaa, not because we care about black people, but we want to cater to their ego and increase milkshake sales. We want to cater to their ego and increase cheeseburger sales. We want to cater to their ego and increase apple pie sales and Whopper sales. 
That's what we're, we don't care about a con culture. We don't even know what the kente cloth stands for, but we do know black people like it and they don't mind if we expropriate it. So we're going to exploit the kente cloth for the sake of corporate profit. And we're going to wear it during Kwanzaa and Black History Month. So they associate McDonald's and Wendy's and Burger King and Checkers with kente so we can make more money. So now kente cloth has lost its meaning in America. Kente cloth has lost its meaning in America, just like the Ethiopian flag has lost its power and the Malcolm X movement has lost its power. And guess what's next? What is the next symbol to die? What is the next slogan to die? Black Lives Matter is next up on the lynching tree. Black Lives Matter, the slogan, the symbol is next up on the lynching tree because you Negroes are so multicultural that you don't know how to keep stuff to yourself. Now, let me go back to the NBA. I want you to understand, understand, and overstand me. I want you to understand, understand, and overstand me. I want you to understand, understand, and overstand me. Now, getting back to the NBA, for those of you who said painting Black Lives Matter for a multi-billion dollar corporation is a start. I've already told you earlier, when you get hustled, that's not the beginning, that's the end. When you get hustled out of a card game, that's not the beginning, that's the end. When you get hustled at the lottery or at the casino, that's not the beginning, that's the end. When you buy something and overpay for it, that's not the beginning of the negotiation, that's the end. You should not be letting the NBA use the Black Lives Matter slogan at all. Once they put that on the court, Black Lives Matter is no longer sacred to black people. It is an American corporate symbol. The takeover is coming the first night of the NBA season. Once Black Lives Matter gets painted on that court, it is no longer a sacred black symbol or sign. It is now an American corporate commodity. Congratulations, you coons. Congratulations, you coons. Congratulations, you coons. If the NBA cares about black folks, if the NBA cares about black people, how about they hire more black coaches? How about they...